Welcome, this is David the Real Mint Why. Today we're going to be talking about monergism and I got this idea, I felt like I had to make this video a couple of weeks ago when I was watching the Trent Horn versus Dr. James White debate and it was a good debate, I enjoyed it. Uh, many people seem to state that Mr. Horn won, uh, Mr. Horn won. I seem to agree with that assessment, but I felt like during the whole debate, I very much expected at least a mention of Christology somewhat. And I didn't see that. I didn't see that happening. And that really disappointed me. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to be evaluating monogism from a Christological standpoint. But before we do that, let's talk about what monogism is. Let's just give a crash course. It's that, the sal it's that salvation is dependent on gra God's grace and will. Uh, it's opposed to synergism, right? So when it comes to salvation, man's will is completely irrelevant when it comes to salvation. Now, this is actually a very key point because if we argued for synergism, meaning that man's will is indeed important to salvation, first of all, that will run contrary to sola fide. Some people might argue that it doesn't. I think that's a separate debate. But at the same time, especially for people like James White, who's very adamant on uh, defending his slogan, which is that if you can lose your salvation, then that means God failed in doing his job, right? So God cannot fail to do his job. Therefore, uh, when God saves someone, a Christian cannot lose his salvation, no matter what he does. So this is a typical, I will say Calvinist position that he's defending. And here's one of the slides that he has that where he points out this model. This is really the central issue that he outlines. And it explains both monergism and synergism in some way, right? Uh, monergism essentially posits that in salvation, it's all God's work. So you can't lose your salvation. Now, before we move on to the refutation, I want to make a brief note because I think this is very key for us to understand. Uh, this video is not about quoting biblical verses. It's about Christology, who Christ is, and it's about how we are redeemed. So let's talk about that a little bit. Christ is a legislator and the model of our salvation. By his divinity, he's a legislator, and by his humanity, he's the model of our salvation. Because he's the second Adam, he is reversing the fall of Adam. So it's kind of like an inversion of the fall. And the patterns of our human behavior, as Proverbs 8.22 says, is based on Christ's life. Now, how is this relevant? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, Christ himself, in our view, is a proof of synergism because in his divinity, he is the legislator, in his humanity, he is the model for us. Now, of course, Christ is purely a divine person, but he is human by nature. And this is what we're starting to get here, is that because he's human by nature, he has human faculties, namely will, right? Uh, one of them is will, sorry. So one of them being wills. But in that case, we have to an closely analyze the monarchist position to see if it really holds the traditional orthodox position of diatheletism. Now, in the 7th century, you had a disputation between monothelites and diatheletes. Diatheletes were people like St. Maximus the Confessor, uh, people that believe Christ had two wills, a human will and a divine will, but not just any human will, but a free, self-determining human will. Not a free human will. This is a very key thing to note. So a natural human will and a natural divine will. Monothelites argued that Christ, most of them argued that Christ had a divine will. Some of them argued that it was a composite, theandric will, uh, and some of them argued that it's one divine will, but the human will is appropriated, right? So there are quite different positions of monothelite thought, but we are looking at monogism and how it implies monothelitism. So let's look into this problem more in detail. If God's, if only, if, if, when it, no, let me start that again. If in our salvation, only God's will is the thing that matters, then human will is to be ignored, Right? Because human will is overpowered and overtaken by God's grace and energy. But then that means in Christ, his human will either doesn't exist or it's not free. Because in salvation, as I mentioned before, the divine will and grace overpowers the human wills and faculties in order to save that 
humanity in order to save the human being. But if it isn't free, if the human will isn't free, then we can't really argue Christ is a human. I, mean, I will get back to this later on. But it either, but the conclusion I'm going to get to here, the human will either doesn't exist or it's subject to the divine will. Now, very key note that I have to make here. As I mentioned before, many monotolites will actually say Christ did possess a human will. What we're talking about here is a free, self-determining, proper, actual human will, not a human will that is merely a tool of the divine will, right? So we will say, for example, in contrast, here's an example of a position. We will say that Christ, Christ's human will is actually subject to the divine will. What we do say that the human will is still nevertheless free, it freely obeys God. So this is an exact. This is a key example of synergism. If a Calvinist says this, he is contradicting synergism, right? Any monergist, uh, he's contradicting monergism. Sorry, any monergist that says Christ does have a free human will is contradicting monergism, because how can the human will be freely working in synergy with the divine will, if that can be the case with Christ? So too can it be the case for us. Right, unless there's some case of spe special plea. Now, of course, Christ is a divine person and, and all of that, but nevertheless, he's the model for salvation. Right? We need we need not to forget that. So if the human will does not exist, some might say, Well, I don't think the human will exists. I disagree with the sixth ecumenical council. I think Christ only had a divine will. Then you have to ask, well, what is it? What is the what is will property? Well, obviously it's property person. And it's kind of obvious the person is the one that wills, right? Then in that case, in the Trinity, because there are three persons, you have three wills. Okay, that's tritheism. So that le that's, leads to tritheism that completely pushes you away from traditional Trinitarian thought. If Christ does indeed have a human will, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. I do believe that he is a human will. Uh, it's subject but to the divine will, but it's still a human will. Well, it's not enumerated because, again, as you said, it's subject to the divine will. We will get back to this more in detail in the conclusions of it later. In either case, the human will is not assumed, therefore it is not healed, therefore Christ did not assume the fullness of human nature. Right? This is taken from St. Gregory of Nazianz's letter to Clodonus. He doesn't talk about the wills, but he talks about how things that are assumed are being healed. Now, you might say, well, Christ didn't have to assume it, to heal it. Might be a response, but I think that's pretty silly because if you look at the way we are said, many of the, many of the uh, Protestants, Reformed theologians will say, well, we are said because God was crucified for us, right? God is crucified for us and he took the penalty of sin on himself. Well, wait a minute, but didn't he become human? Didn't he assume that position? In the crucifixion? Well, yes, he did. But if you don't have to assume something to heal it, then he does not have to assume himself on the cross either. Oh, but then the crucifixion was not needed then in that system. So I think that kind of leads to nonsensical positions. Uh, let's look at the free will and consubstantiality. Now, Calvin posits that man has a free will. As a matter of fact, the way he defines it is pretty close to orthodoxy. Uh, he says that it is... The human free will is by definition self-determining, that it's by definition it's free. But as we looked at before, we cannot say Christ is a free human will. It says free will in the slide, but I'm I mean free human will. But then there's a huge problem here. Um, <clears throat> right? A, or or human will by nature is free. Christ's human will is not free then that kind of implies that there are two different wills. <clears throat> if there are two different wills, and we know that wills are a faculty of nature, well, wait a second, that kind of implies, that doesn't kind of implies, that pretty much implies and strongly implies that Christ is not consubstantial with us. If he does not have the same free self-determining human will, just like we do, then he cannot be said to be consubstantial with us because it's a property of nature. But what is proper to his nature is different to what is proper to us, then the natures are different. Uh, St. Gregory of Nazian, and before I get to that actually, <clears throat> Luther and Calvin 
have this view that the human will and divine will naturally are in tension and opposition with each other. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, in contrast, will say that his will, meaning that Christ's human will, is not contrary to God, but it's deified, right? So these are two different positions that are in contrast with each other. Now, we made this point, right? Some Calvinists might come up and say, well, I don't really care about your... Uh, there's also another point that to be made. If you made the point that... I'll get to the part later, but we can also make the point that if a Calvinist says, well, yes, I'm a monotelite. Yes, I don't care about your doctrines of men. I don't believe in your traditions of men. I don't care about your ecumenical councils. Now, here's the problem. He, he will have to deny continuity. Right? If anyone assumes the position of monotelitism, he is pretty much denying continuity with the early church because the early church believed in diotelitism. The Sixth Ecumenical Council affirms diotelitism. So he's taking the side of the heretics here. Um, what's also ironic is that monophysites and historians alike are also monotelites, but that's a different, that's a different set of conversations. But this is a very important thing, and or salvation is very much connected with Christology. Another mistake that many Reformed theologians make, Dr. James might make this, make this mistake, is I can't speak properly today. <laughs> uh, Dr. James might makes this mistake. He makes the mistake of prioritizing soteriology. This is our, I'm copying and copying this argument from Jay Dyer. He is prioritizing soteriology and he's putting Christology in the back burner. He's kind of not caring about Christology. But this is this is the fruit of prioritizing soteriology over Christology. Or soteriology is dependent on Christology. That's how we view it. Now, this argument that I will be making, some of you might be very confused because um, how can Calvinism... How can monergism be universalist? That seems pretty strange. Actually, it is not strange. Now, one simple Bible verse that we want to showcase is 1 Timothy 2 4. Now, I'm pretty sure there are adequate responses to this, but it's it, I think it's a good conversation starter. Uh, this, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, right? So God's will is that all men are saved. Now, again, I understand that this is most like, like, I don't believe that you can completely debunk and destroy traditions just by a single Bible verse. I don't think it's as simple as that. People that think that it is as simple as that are generally joke kidding themselves, I think. But I think it's a good conversation started. I think it's a good point to start in understanding. And what I'm, what I'm going to be talking about here is the Eastern understanding of recapitulation and the eschaton. Now, we believe that Christ is going to reconcile all creation and restore all nature and all creation back to its proper form, back to what it should be. So this is echoed by St. Paul in his letter to Col Colossians. He says, by him, to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. So this is an explicit argumentation when, when it comes to recapitulation this can be subject to debate however we have to understand that in the eschaton there is some sort of a rest or universal restoration of all things now this is very key to what i'm getting here just like all men are predestined to be subject to death because of adam so are all men because of christ predestined to be subject to the consequence of his crucifixion resurrection that is eternal being now, unless you hold to annihilationism, you will believe that eternal being is a thing, right? By God's grace and, and whatnot. But wait a second. We are subject to the consequences of Christ's crucifixion. We are going to be restored in Christ. We are going to be recapitulated, recapitulated in Christ. All of our nature is going to be restored. But wait a second. Our restoration is going to be a model of the hypostatic union. Now, this is... This is very key. If it's only God's will, if it's if monergism is true and God restores all things, we have a problem here. If God restores all things, then doesn't that mean that all are going to be saved? Oh, suddenly David Bentley Hart is right. 
Uh-oh. So how can we solve this problem? Well, first of all, we believe in diatelitism. We will respond to this. With, as I made this response in my universalism refuted video. Our response to this will be that each person has a personalized mode of willing, right? So because of that, the way we willed in our life is going to affect our subjective experiences in the eschaton. Now the, now the reformed theologian, Mr. White, cannot say this. Why can he not say this? Well, because the, it doesn't matter how we experience the salvation. Only God's will matters. Monergism, right? So, so God succeeds in saving you. And at the same time, in Christ, uh, the human will of Christ is completely subservient to the divine will. It's overpowered by God's divine grace. Shouldn't that also apply to us as well? Well, naturally it does. And that is where the problem lies. So monergism at the same time implies universalism, unless you have a very freaky eschatological doctrine, which you might have, right? I don't, I'm not very well versed in Calvinistic eschatology. Um, if I'm missing something very obvious here, please do let me know. But I think, and, and this is not the only thing, this is not an exhaustive list. We can go on more, but this should be a good basic conversation starter i think so in summary to summarize christ being the mod legislator of our salvation him being legis him legislating how we are saved showcases his divine will but at the same time christ being the model of our salvation legislates uh, showcases sorry showcases his humanity his human will and this showcases a synergy unlike what mr white tries to tell us uh man denying salvation does not mean that god failed in what he does god does succeed in what he does but or rejection or personalized experiences matters that's why we're not universalists because we will say everyone is saved in some sense everything is restored but a man who in his entire life lived contrary to God, even if God saves him, his salvation to him is going to be poison, right? So this is a point that uh, I would like to make to many Calvinists and monergists. <clears throat> the second point is monergism, because in our salvation, the human will is completely overpowered by the divine will. In that seen in that anthropology, it leads to monotheism, which is a condemned heresy in the 7th century in the 6th Ecumenical Council. And to argue for monotheism, well, you kind of, it, it pretty much implies that Christ is not consubstantial with us because he has a different human will. If he has a different human will with a different set of properties, and these properties are faculties of nature, because the fa because the faculties uh, because the properties of this will is different, the nature therefore also has to be different. Because the nature is also different, he's not consubstantial with us. Therefore, God does not assume human nature. Another problem. And ultimately, monergism leads to universalism, because God wills all men to be saved. God is going to recapitulate all creation, and restore all creation. And I cannot see any way that a, that a monergist can argue how that does not lead to universalism. I will be very interested. Thank you all for watching this. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe, like. If you want to share your thoughts, point out a mistake I made because I think I might have made a mistake. Maybe I was pretty solid in my presentation. I don't know. Uh, make sure to comment. And if you want to see some more content, more motivation for me, be sure to be my pay piggy. I'm joking. Be sure to, if you want to, if you feel the need to, donate to my Patreon. If you don't want to, that's fine. That's wonderful. We support freeloaders. We are pro freeloaders in this YouTube channel. So if you don't, if you want to freeload, that is completely fine. We love you. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next video. God bless you all.